So uh, welcome back. And uh, today we'll be talking about the uh, pre-initials or consonant clusters, uh, onset consonant clusters of Old Chinese. And I'll start with some general considerations of uh, whether or not it's plausible to reconstruct uh, consonant clusters or uh, so-called pre-initials, uh, and then uh, move on um, to uh, some evidence uh, that uh, makes them plausible. And then in uh, separate uh, lectures, I'll look at the, the, the concrete evidence for, um, for specific proposals like uh, uh, pre-initial S or pre-initial T. Uh, so this lecture is just more about the general approach and uh, the overall plausibility. So uh, let's begin. Baxter and Sagar reconstruct the following pre-initials in Old Chinese, uh, P, K, T, M, uh, capital N, which is a, a, a prefix that uh, assimilates in terms of uh, place of articulation uh, to the following uh, consonant, and finally S. And I'll just throw in here that I have a sort of um, terminological objection to, to pre-initial uh, because, you know, um, initial should mean the beginning. Uh, the, and uh, so a pre-initial means before the beginning, which is a kind of paradoxical sounding. Uh, but it, clearly it has to do with a, a, a phonotactic uh, theory of Old Chinese. Uh, but uh, I wonder whether uh, this terminology is used in other research traditions, if there are languages that, that have this kind of... Uh, uh, phonotactic structure. Uh, I think we should we should engage more uh, with uh, those traditions and see how they uh, describe this. But uh, here in Sino Tibetan linguistics, uh, this is the conventional term pre initial. So each of these pre initials occurs in both a tight form, uh, that's to say, you know, segmentally immediately adjacent, uh, which they annotate as, uh, for example, t uh, dot k, uh, or in a loose form where there's a, a schwa vowel that uh, interposes itself between the pre-initial and uh, the initial. So uh, with R, there are actually three options. Uh, there's a, a, the, the T initial followed by the R medial, the T pre-initial followed by the R initial, and the, um, the uh, T loose pre-initial followed by a schwa followed by the R uh, initial. So uh, now ref returning to this discussion of, of TR, uh, Baxter and Cigar don't discuss what phonetic distinction they see between uh, TR and T uh, dot R, although they uh, develop differently into uh, Middle Chinese. So, um, so there must have been a phonetic difference, yeah? Now, um, one thing I want to draw your attention to is that uh, there have been some changes in the treatment of uh, pre-initials in uh, Sagar's work uh, from his 1999 book to uh, the 2014 uh, book uh, together with Baxter. And, um, and uh, the um, change in approach uh, I, I guess implies a difference in uh, how they're treating certain kinds of uh, evidence. So uh, if we look at the word armpit uh, in 1999, uh, Sagar pointed to the, the Cantonese word for, for armpit and the Fucho word for armpit, armpit and said, well, look, both of those have some kind of um, k, you know, minor syllable or pre-initial. Uh, so he reconstructed that also uh, for Old Chinese. But if we look at uh, the 2014 reconstruction, uh, they don't um, they don't uh, reconstruct it uh, that way anymore. So they they uh, they're actually quite agnostic. That's what the the brackets mean. The brackets mean that they're they're tentatively suggesting the solution that's in the brackets, uh, but that any solution uh, that yields the same result in Middle Chinese, they wouldn't necessarily be unhappy with. And I think that this is a sort of let's say, a, a murky area or, or something that's quite difficult for users of their reconstruction 
because it's all fine and well to know that, um, you know, that they are a little ambivalent here, but they didn't reconstruct this word with a K initial. So there must be some reason they think it had a uvular initial. Uh, and that is a little bit out of focus. And, and which another way to put it is, it's not clear what these different levels of their, you know, subjective certainty, we as users of the reconstruction are meant to do with. Yeah. So how, how are we meant to interact with uh, a, a reconstruction differently if it has a, um, if it has these brackets or not? In any case, uh, the point I want to draw attention to here is that uh, apparently the Cantonese and Fuchou evidence is no longer probative uh, in terms of their reconstruction. And uh, presumably th th they arose, uh, sorry, they, they arrived at the decision uh, that that wasn't uh, significant uh, anymore to them through some process, uh, but, they, but they don't make that explicit. So, I mean, that's, that's understandable that you can't write down everything you think in a book. Uh, but it, it, as a user, I've found it difficult to sort of look at the 1999 book and look at the 2014 book and not really know kind of uh, where you are in terms of uh, similarities or differences there. Okay, so um, yeah, so so uh, where I am still then is saying kind of um, the kinds of reasons why you might be skeptical about uh, um, the solution of, of pre-initials in uh, Baxter Scar 2014, uh, which include that, that, that they seem to have changed their minds without telling us why, yeah? So in, um, in 1999, uh, Cigar's working assumption is that uh, the pre-initials are all, you know, morphologically meaningful and appear in all of them in two forms, uh, uh, tight and loose, as I described earlier. And, uh, and that basically you get, uh, you get, you know, in terms of root structure, you get plain roots, roots with a tight pre-initial and roots with uh, a loose uh, pre-initial. And he says that these three types of forms uh, perhaps existed side by side in old Chinese as stylistic or social variants. And now I just want to point out that um, this is methodologically a problem for, for those of us who are committed to uh, neo-grammarian uh, principles. And the reason for that is, you know, that you can't, you know, it's a total wild card. You, 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 you can't have um, a, uh, a, a sound change that's, unpredictable. Um, so, you know, I mean, some of you will say, well, but come on, these things happen. There are socio, uh, variant, sociolinguistic variants and stylistic variants. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that like, there's just something a little bit, um, I don't know, it, it, it really is uh, using a wild card to say, well, this word developed like this, and this word developed, the same word developed instead like this, for, for sociolinguistic reasons, yeah. You would want strong positive evidence of that rather than uh, assuming it. Um, and, you know, let's say altogether, the, the evidence for pre-initials is pretty weak, um, but um, Baxter and Cigar's system embraces more types of evidence uh, than other uh, reconstruction systems, and um, their system is uh, sort of informationally richer, which is to say, like, if I want to change a Baxter and Cigar system of old Chinese reconstruction into uh, Schussler's, it's quite easy to do. Now, now that's partly because uh, Baxter and Cigar and Schussler are both in the six vowel camp. It's quite uh, hard to move between reconstructions uh, in the six vowel camp and those not in the six vowel camp. Uh, but let's say if the disagreement is, is just about uh, initials uh, and, and one system has more initials and one system has fewer initials, then, um, then I guess what, what I'm saying is I feel like using the system with more distinctions is better even if it's wrong because uh, it, it it's just providing, if it's wrong, it's just providing redundant information that doesn't really get in the way. 
Yeah, it's it's like just adding diacritics for no reason. Uh, and if it's right, then it's right. So uh, uh, and then and then just to kind of talk through the converse, if a system has too few distinctions, if it's wrong, then there's no way to you know to fix that. Like so, I think it's better to to work with uh, a system that has more uh, distinctions, even if some of those distinctions will turn out to be uh, incorrect. Okay. And uh, and that's why I think particularly for for comparative linguistics, Baxter and Cigar system is better because maybe some of these distinctions that they make will correspond to phenomena in other languages. And you wouldn't notice that if you didn't allow yourself to draw the distinction. So just for, you know, for reasons having, like as a research program, it's better to work with an old Chinese reconstruction system with more distinctions. Okay. Now, mostly so far, I have talked about reasons to be, you know, a little skeptical, a little, some problems that I see, so the, the fact that there's not a lot of um, evidence for pre-initials, but now let's look at the, the, the strong uh, reasons, the kind of best evidence for their being, uh, for their being pre-initials. So particularly, perhaps uniquely in the Shijing, uh, there are cases where two characters are used to render a single word. So I'm, I'm going to go through these, you know, quite uh, slowly. So in the first type, uh, we have a prefix ma. So uh, let's see it. Ode. Uh, 235.5, we have this phrase, which at face value means, do not remember your ancestors. Well, if, uh, if you know anything about traditional Chinese culture, uh, this will seem like a very uh, <laughs> surprising sentiment to express. Uh, and, and let's say that interpretation relies on the fact that this ma is, is a common uh, negation marker. It's one of the it's one of the the top two negation markers. But the Mao commentary, which is the earliest extant commentary that you know that is let's say fundamental to uh, interpreting the odes, has this remark that says, "Do not remember" means remember. Um, so how do we uh, understand that? You know, it, it's it's saying ignore the ma, yeah. So Baxter and Cigar interpret uh, this ma as a loose uh, uh, prefix that makes this verb uh, nim to think of vol volitional. And this, you know, it's not just for this occasion that they propose this. They, they believe that uh, in terms of old Chinese morphology, there was this ma volitional prefix. And, uh, and so they think that this prefix was added to make this uh, remember uh, volitional. And, and you, that's because you can't command someone to do something uh, unless uh, it's a volitional verb. Yeah. So that's their uh, interpretation of this passage. Now let's look at another one. This is uh, O256. Uh, this phrase seems to mean uh, not strong is this man, the four realms comply with him. Well, that doesn't make any sense, right? If the four realms are complying with him, then he probably is strong, yeah? And the Mao commentary says, uh, not strong means strong. Uh, so here, um, uh, Baxter and Cigar think that this Ma uh, spells out the M prefix uh, in, in the word uh, strive, compete, which they reconstruct for, for other reasons. And now I'll just say um, a, a word about why does this phenomenon, why is it restricted to uh, predominantly to the, to the O's? And I think there's a reason that that, that could, could be explained, um, which is that the odes are poetry. 
and they're very, very old. So imagine, uh, or I, I think it's useful to think about French uh, and how you sing French. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I don't know whether everyone will know this, but, um, uh, and, and, you know, if I had uh, prepared uh, better ahead of time, I would have a French song to hand. Uh, but um, if you listen to basically any French uh, uh, art song, uh, but even in uh, some pop music today, you'll notice that uh, the, the schwa vowels that have all disappeared from uh, spoken French are still pronounced in, uh, in music. Uh, and, and partly uh, that has to be uh, because, I mean, I'm not saying it's the only factor, but it has to be because the tune wouldn't work if you, if, you know, if you have a note that you're supposed to hit on one of these syllables, you need to have the syllable there. Uh, and I think that that's, um, you, you know, you can understand that as partly an explanation for, um, you know, the, the odes are the kind of genre in terms of, you know, uh, folk songs, let's say, um, uh, folk songs that are kind of ossified as traditional literary monuments are the kind of genre exactly where you would expect uh, these, uh, these uh, minor syllables to sometimes be preserved for metrical or musical reasons. Okay, so uh, now just to point out that uh, similar uh, phenomena happen with pa as well as with ma. So again, it looks like negation. Uh, and this one is, you know, trickier, uh, which is to say, I go straight, you know, so far I've said like, oh, it looks like it says this, but it actually says this. Well, in this case, it's really hard to make sense of it at all without the commentary. So, um, uh, so we have these Joe are greatly illustrious. God appointed them. Where there's this, there's this put the which is just quite hard to get any. It means like not time or something. It it, it it's um, it doesn't make any sense. So the mild commentary says. Um, uh, it says that, that uh, not de means de, and de means this other de, which is to say that uh, the Mao commentary is saying pada means this. Uh, so, you know, how, how should we interpret this? It, it, it looks like, you know, the Mao commentary is saying maybe that this pada is somehow the same word as de. Um, and that's, you know, evidence for some kind of minor syllable. Okay. Now, this one is my favorite. It's in some ways uh, better if you read the whole poem, uh, and that's in my book, uh, because from this line of poetry alone, it's not clear that it can't be negation, uh, but certainly in the context of the poem overall, you expect the line uh, to say um, attentive and filled rather than not attentive and not filled. Um, uh, but anyhow, you, know, you can look at my book for, for the details of that. But I just want to point out uh, that in this case, uh, the word for filled then is, uh, it's at the very end of the, the line, you can see it in the opinion, pulung. And uh, this perfectly matches uh, the, the, the Burmese uh, situation. So fill in Burmese is, I don't know, I, you know, it would actually be pronounced pien in modern Burmese, but let's say it's something like pl plan. Uh, well, it uh, comes from pling in, um, in Proto-Burmish. And, um, and, and actually, uh, uh, proto burmish merged Eng and Ing. We, we don't need to get into those details. But in any case, it's, it's really a perfect match uh, with the, the old Chinese reconstruction uh, Pe Leng. And, you know, um, some people would say, and actually, um, uh, uh, Georgie or Orlandi in his review of my book says like, OK, yeah, it's kind of good evidence, but this is maybe a coincidence. You know, my own feeling is, is actually this is just like, uh, you know, this is good. This is basically as good as something like um, uh, 
uh, Veda in Sanskrit and Oida in Greek. You know, you 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 can't make stuff like this up. So um, so I think this is very compelling evidence that in some cases, old Chinese uh, had uh, pre-initials. Oh, that's just a methodological issue, which is, uh, you know, I mean, I, um, um, uh, let's credit this to Meye. I don't know if that's fair or not, but let's say if I'm just looking around the world and saying, ooh, what are related languages? Uh, uh, if I look at um, extremely specific morphological idiosyncrasies, mm -hmm. that is strong evidence of, you know, not a coincidence, right? So let's say the fact that the fact that Greek actually, I mean, what's interesting about the Veda Oida case is is even saying what's surprising already shows you that there's a lot of you know shared kind of categorical similarities. But both languages use an unreduplicated perfect uh, for to see uh, meaning to know. Yeah. Well, that's mm -hmm. that's uh, actually. I mean, some people I've, oh, yeah. I've I've discussed this with some people who say like, "Oh, come on, using some kind of a perfect of to see to mean to know is just dead obvious, right? Like that doesn't mean anything about how related languages are." But I would say, well, the fact that they're un it's an unreduplicated perfect, <laughs> that, that's uh, the mm. part that's a kind of uh, striking coincidence. So I was maybe I was sort of overstating it, but I think the fact that Old Chinese and Burmese both have a word fill that that has the same morphological structure, and and so they they both go back to something like plang, is you know quite good evidence. Uh, uh, let's say, on the one hand that they're related languages, and on the other hand that 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 p in Old Chinese is not some random thing, you know, which is to say, uh, if you like, who's my interlocutor? The 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 people in Beijing will have a story to tell about that Bu character in that poem, and and usually they say, that, oh, these things are sort of uh, rhetorical questions. Uh, and you can use rhetorical questions to mean the opposite. So, so we can understand it as a negation marker. You know, they actually meant, like the commentary said, they say not full to mean full, you know, in, in, in a kind of, that's, I think, I mean, I don't really know this literature, but I think that's those people who really want to deny that evidence say that. And then I would say, look, I don't think it's a coincidence that this, this P is there in Old Chinese and in, in Old Burmese. Okay, so um, now we're moving outside the odes. There's uh, less of this type of evidence, but there is some. Uh, the Shouwen Jiezi, uh, which is a character dictionary from the early Han period, uh, says about this character that means uh, brush. Uh, you know, it defines it as that with which one writes, and then it gives some comments about dialectology. So in Chu, it's called Murut. In Wu, it's called Prut. Uh, in Yan, it's called Put. And in Qin, it's called Prut. Uh, yes, Etienne. Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt again. I was just uh, wondering, uh, so do we, uh, do we think that uh, these were actually, uh, these three initials were actually one syllable? Or uh, could we not consider that they just indicate maybe a consonant and because of the writing system, I mean, uh, uh, they did not have uh, any choice but to write a full syllable, so they would write a schwa, but maybe, uh, so are there people that think that it was not uh, per root uh, as this syllabic, but like really root, and like uh, how could we know whether uh, it was a disyllabic or a monosyllabic uh, pronunciation? I mean, maybe you were about to go... Uh, no. I was not going to, let's say, um, it's a good question, and we certainly know from, I mean, some of you will know this kind of stuff better than I do. Um, I think in the, in, in Akkadian or in Sumerian or, oh, oh, actually Mycenaean is, 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 yeah, Mycenaean is a good example. Some of you are taking Mycenaean. Uh, they don't have the, the resources in the Mycenaean script to write consonant clusters, so they write them with um, uh, 
uh, with uh, kind of in this way. That's the sort of thing you have in mind, yeah? So um, it, uh, I would say, I don't think anyone has discussed this. Uh, and it's clearly, let's say, Baxter and Sagar have this clear theory of, you know, there are tight pre-initials and loose pre-initials. And that theory helps them do a certain amount of work. And that, that's what we'll see uh, kind of in today's presentation. So if you wanted to come up with an alternative theory, it would have to sort of solve the same problems uh, and um, yeah, and then what I would say is uh, kind of at face value that analysis of like oh maybe these this was this these minor syllables uh, when written out only indicates uh, co consonant clusters and not uh, actual s syllables would make particular sense in those cases where you know someone is trying to write a foreign language or a dialect form um, but uh, which, which you know is the case here uh, but i think like for the odes it wouldn't work at all right you know because the odes would have been probably sung so each character probably really did correspond to a syllable uh, anyhow that's um, what i would say uh, I would, you know, it, it's it's one of many topics that that it would be nice to have more systematic uh, study of. There there is uh, work in Chinese, um, but I would say actually that that most Chinese scholarship of of a philological or paleographic variety um, uses Wang Li's reconstruction as his point of departure. So um, it's hard to make interact with. Uh, kind of today's um, historical phonology. Although hopefully this is, there's some evidence that this is changing uh, right around now. Um, uh, but anyhow, so um, so here on this slide, then we have, uh, we see variation among uh, put, prut, and porut, uh, and that is pretty good evidence for, you know, um, constant clusters in, in uh, Old Chinese. Although precisely because it's about different dialects, it, it's not very good evidence of a of a tight versus loose pre-initial, which is sort of what you were saying actually, uh, in any particular variety of, of Chinese. Uh, but here is kind of um, my my favorite uh, kind of a bit of evidence along these lines, and for and one reason it's my favorite, which I'll talk you through is it actually works with Baxter and Cigar's system. So for example, that pl pleng that I discussed matching Burmese perfectly, that's not actually a, a case that uh, Baxter and Cigar see any need to reconstruct the P initial in terms of their own system and in terms of Chinese internal evidence. It's really just the evidence of the shujing itself that points to that. Uh, uh, or to, to paraphrase what I'm saying, one might believe that old Chinese had pre-initials and, um, and that those pre-initials distinguish tight and loose and still not think that Baxter and Sagar reconstruct them in the right places or for the right reasons. Uh, and this example is, is the best case of, let's say, everything coming together nicely in the Baxter and Sagar system in terms of different sources of evidence. So let's just go through it. Uh, this is a, a comment uh, by uh, Mr. Uh, Yan Ji Tui. So he says, I have exhaustively visited the Shu region and they pronounce uh, this word, grain or particle, let's call it lip as pick. But at the time they had no way to explain it. And then I said, well, in the San Tsang, and the Shouwen, that's the Shouwen Jiezi, which we just looked at. This word is written as this character and this character together. And then I, I show you the character, yeah. Uh, and is glossed in both cases at, with the definition, you know, grain or particle. And in this other book, it, it's given the pronunciation pick. And they were all uh, delighted to discover this. 
So what, yeah, so, so what is this saying? In sort of mainstream Chinese, this word would have been pronounced uh, lip, but in this dialect, it was pronounced pick, and there is philological evidence for pronouncing it as pick, and, you know, uh, I don't know how we should reconstruct it then, but presumably with some kind of pl initial cl cluster. Okay, now we look at... Um, at uh, proto-min, and we see that it uh, has a softened initial. And softened initials in proto-min are the reason that Baxter and Cigar reconstruct, uh, or let me put that differently. When min has, when proto-min has uh, softened initials, uh, uh, They reconstruct tight pre's, and I'm not actually. I'm not quite sure. I'm getting this right, so we should check my book to be absolutely sure. But in any case, the min form supports the reconstruction in Baxter and Cigar system of a pre-initial before uh, a rhotic. So in this case, we have kind of first-hand, you know, ancient dialectical uh, fieldwork that you know, slots in nicely to Baxter and Cigar system. And that's what I uh, wanted to uh, say, which is to say, I think this is the best case of showing not only that uh, Baxter and Cigar's kind of overall system is right, but that they're in fact right uh, in their concrete proposals of, of what correspondence is to reconstruct in which ways. Um, let's say from within the Baxter cigar system, you would say they are loose pre-initials. I don't feel comfortable calling them consonant clusters. Uh, um, but uh, um, it doesn't seem like at that time uh, you had sort of properly disyllabic words. And what do I mean by that? I mean, like the, the, the cases of two character words in the odes are very rare. And th those that do occur either have wu or have uh, bu as their first character. Uh, so that I I indicates that, um, you know, the extent of disyllabicity is quite um, limited. And in uh, Baxter's 1999 book, he refers to this kind of syllable as a iambic syllable, uh, you know, because an iam has the stress pattern, the th, right? So it's kind of a minor syllable and then a major syllable. Uh, James Matasoff uh, refers to them as sesqui syllables, uh, which, which is like to mean like a, it's sort of half, like one and a half syllables. So between monosyllable and disyllable. Personally, I think that sesquisyllable is just a kind of hideous term, um, but you know that's not a criticism as, as an idea. And um, uh, this kind of, let's say, this kind of uh, phonotactic pattern is not at all unusual for Asia. Uh, um, many of the, particularly many of the Vietic languages uh, have that kind of profile. Uh, and I think, um, I think uh, Taikadai languages, I, this gets into stuff I don't know much about, but let's say that kind of uh, phonotactic profile is not at all unusual in, uh, in, in Asia, yeah. Um, what to say, uh, just a clarification, the claim that, um, sort of the coexistence of the same morpheme in variance with tight and loose pre-initials uh, is explainable by sociolinguistic or stylistic variation uh, is a claim only made by Cigar, as far as I know, not Baxter and Cigar. 
and it was made in the 1999 book, not in the 2014 book. Uh, and you know, I kind of do they does Cigar still believe it? Does Baxter believe it? You know, we have no way of knowing other than asking them. Yeah. Um, so that's just a, a, a kind of a clarification around the history of the discipline. And what I would say is, I think the Shouwen Jizu presents quite good evidence that there was dialectical variation of this type. I would really like someone to, to look at the Fanyan, um, sorry, the Fanyan, uh, and I'll just explain a little bit about that for, for those of you who, who don't know, you know, all these old Chinese books. But there actually is a work from um, ancient times. Uh, that uh, that you know is is a work of dialectology, um, and um, and it includes we think both Chinese dialects and non Chinese languages, um, uh, and um, uh, it uh, I mean it's it's a famous work it's been extensively studied, uh, but it has not been studied. Uh, as far as I know, by anyone working in uh, the six vowel tradition uh, recently. Uh, and the last time it was uh, looked at um, by uh, in, in the sort of Anglophone scholarship was in the 1960s. So, so um, I would really love it if someone would look at the Fangyan as um, uh, with an eye on this question is, is are there dialectical variations between pre-initial, uh, between tight and loose pre-initials in the Fangyan. Um, I think there likely will be, um, but um, the uh, thing that I want to say right now is my point in so showing you those slides actually wasn't about is it sociolinguistic, is it uh, dialectal, it's just to kind of build a sense that reconstructing pre-initials in Old Chinese is not a crazy thing to do. And, uh, and maybe I should have just kind of contextualized that anyone associated with Beida, uh, with P Peking University, thinks it's just madness. It's just like absolutely only lunatics think that old Chinese had uh, consonant clusters. So um, that, that, that's why I wanted to just sort of show you that in, in really strong, you know, uh, like, like, like really solidly sinological evidence, there is good reason to think that there are pre-initials in, uh, in ancient Chinese. Of course, uh, you know, to be fair to uh, our, um, our colleagues at, at Beida, uh, they know about this material and they have other ways of analyzing it. Um, but, um, but let's say, uh, that's not what this course is about. <laughs> I, I just wanted to start with, you know, kind of in the way I've been in trying to do with, with all things, let's look at really what is the evidence in the primary sources that's, that's motivating these theoretical ideas. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think that's, any, that's a, a totally fair uh, characterization. Um, but uh, I would object a little bit to saying that it's um, unusual because Old Chinese, you can think of as, um, you know, and it, Old Chinese is an attested language. So we're not doing, we're not reconstructing a proto language like Proto Germanic here. We're basically figuring out, like, uh, you know, it's more like figuring out how Greek was pronounced. It's just that the, the Greek alphabet is much more transparent. Than Chinese characters as a way of uh, recording, you know, uh, phonology, and I think if you look at, uh, you know, the literature about how Greek was pronounced, they will look at exactly the same kinds of evidence, like, um, you know, what does the organization of the script itself imply? Uh, how was the script adapted for other languages? What are sort of meta comments in uh, the philological literature from ancient times about? Uh, the pronunciation of words, uh, and then you'll also look at, uh, you know, uh, loan words into other languages, and very occasionally at maybe, you know, modern Greek or something like that. So I think actually, if you think of all of this as, um, as, a, as a philological project of uh, 
understanding how an actually attested language was pronounced, there's nothing unusual about uh, these approaches. It's, it's a difference of degree, not a, a qualitative difference uh, from um, the kind of work that's done in interpreting philological sources on uh, any ancient languages in any research tradition. Uh, which is not to say that like there's another project that work has been done on, but not enough work, which is to just reconstruct the um, the ancestor of the the Sinitic languages, and that would give you the equivalent of you know Proto Romance, if you like, uh, you know. So, but but reconstructing Proto Romance and uh, and and uh, interpreting the philological evidence in in phonetic terms of uh, Latin epigraphy, for instance, are different. Uh, yeah, I mean, I it's sort of the, you should maybe just read his book, but um, I'll tell you the kind of crux of it is, is he wants to, he wants to look at roots, right? Rather than sort of saying like, oh, you know, here, here's a character and here's how it was pronounced in Middle Chinese and how is it maybe, how was, I mean, it, these things get actually even hard to say rigorously. How was the word used, no, sorry. <laughs> How was the word, the ancestor of the word that would become this Middle Chinese reading of this character pronounced in Old Chinese? That's kind of what Chinese historical phonology does, generally speaking. Instead, he wants to look at like, you know, uh, uh, Old Chinese is not just a collection of syllables, yeah, used in reading practice, there it, it was a language, which means that, let's say, words that have similar pronunciation and related meanings probably are exhibiting morphological uh, behavior. And so he pro posits a kind of uh, a theory of root structure, which is basically that you know uh, Ch Chinese has has roots, and then it has affixes, and this is how you build affixes from roots. And he, um, and then, and then he does some case studies about you know how productive that uh, theory is. It's clear that the 2014 uh, reconstruction is, let's say, very inflected by that period of his work. Uh, but uh, the 2014 book does not present uh, a, a a similar kind of um, root theory. And in fact, there are cases, I won't be able to name any right off the top of my head, but there are, there are cases where, where they proposed stuff in 2014 that would have been strictly forbidden in the 1999 framework. So, uh, you know, so I think, you know, um, there, there are two questions that we can say kind of now in 2021. One is like, what do Baxter and Cigar think about root structure? Uh, and you know, for that you can ask them. I, I think it's it's not knowable based on their publications. Uh, and then the other one is, you know, um, do, um, where are we in terms of bringing together morphology and phonology in the study of Old Chinese? And and the answer is, well, we're not much further along than we were in 1999.